term. Joining us now is Matthew Continetti. He is with AEI Commentary, and he's the founding editor of The Free Beacon. Matthew, good to have you with us, sir. Thanks for having me. It's great of to be course. here. Of course. Of course. So this was a, kind of a wild event last night. The media is still trying to put the pieces together. I've seen a lot of pieces today. Yet their mouths all seem to be agape. They, they can't believe the crowd that showed up last night. Uh, what did you make of it? I thought it was a really daring and bold move by former President Trump. You know, uh, he's been having to hold these unconventional campaign appearances because of the ongoing trial. And, but I actually think it's worked out, whether it's his visit to the bodega or his visit to the uh, New York firefighters or his appearance at a wake for a slain police officer. The New York-based campaign has uh, really highlighted these kind of personal interactions. And here at the appearance in the Bronx, he went into a Democratic stronghold. He attracted a big crowd. And you could just tell from that clip there how energetic he was and how um, energetic the crowd was. So I, I think even though obviously President Trump would, not, would rather not be in the current circumstances of the trial in New York, it's actually helping him politically. I mean, I know he does fantasize about winning a state like New York. That that seems quite honestly completely out of reach. But, I, you know, who knows? Trump has surprised us before. He's within a point in places like Virginia, according to recent surveys. So that's kind of interesting. It, it, it's crystal clear, though, that he is shaking up uh, demographic alignments in the United States. What's the impact of that, do you think? Well, it's huge. I mean, the real uh, driver of his... Uh, place in the polls, leading Joe Biden uh, at the national level and then more significantly leads at the state level, is the fact that we're seeing a realignment in American politics based on education, not race or ethnicity. And so he's winning Hispanic voters across the country. It's one reason why a state like Nevada, which no Republican has won in 20 years, is now looking at the polls practically out of reach for Biden this November. Yeah. And he, Trump is also making big gains among African-American men uh, who uh, there's a real generation gap between younger black voters and older black voters. The younger black voters, they're more interested in economic development, school choice, how will candidates deliver for them? And they're less beholden to kind of the traditional affiliation of black voters with the Democratic Party. This realignment is I think the major story of 2024, and it's what it it's what might put Trump back in the White House next year. Yeah, and and meanwhile, the left has been trying to uh, basically will this away for for now years, suggesting that it wasn't happening, that the only reason Trump had any meaningful coalition was was racist white people, and instead Trump is hurtling towards uh, one of the most impressive multiracial coalitions any of us have ever seen. Right. I mean, a few things uh, are responsible for this remarkable development. And I think the basic factor here is was alluded to by President Trump in the clip we played. People remember the Trump economy. The Trump economy prior to COVID was a full employment economy with rising wages and no inflation. And so now voters are thinking of that economy in relation to the current economy. The current economy has low unemployment, but it has high inflation and high prices, and people are struggling to make ends meet, especially when it comes to basic necessities like food or fuel or rents or buying yeah. a new car. Yeah. And so anyone prefers the Trump economy to the Biden economy. It doesn't matter what race or ethnicity you are. But I think that's the major factor here. Voters of all um, uh, types are, are looking back at the Trump years and saying they had it better off then. And then the second factor is, I think that the Democratic Party has been captured by the left, Vince. I'm sure you talk about this all the time, but you can see it in their reaction to what's happening on the southern border. You can see it in the Democrats' reaction to what is happening on America's campuses with these Hamas sympathizers taking over buildings, taking over campuses. Yeah. You can see it with crime in the streets. And for all these reasons, voters are just fed up. They're looking for a figure of strength, and that figure is former President Trump. Let me, uh, I'm going to play some audio to support the argument you're making here. Coming from the left, this is the raging Cajun James Carville freaking out about how much Biden has been captured by the most radical elements of his party. And I, I just, if I had to, one 
question I'd love for the Biden White House to answer. Why are they so afraid of the left? I, I mean, it, they f***ed them up on immigration policy. They can't even win in, in deep blue areas. And it, they, they come into conflict with, with loosely aligned voters that we have to have. They have very little connection to black America at all. It, yet, it, in the, they proportionally punch way above their weight. And I, I just, somebody, somebody understand it. There got to be a reason for it. I just, I don't see why people even fear these people. I really don't. And they're, they're, just, they're just a drag on everything. Um, but uh, one day someone will explain it to me. Yeah, he's confused. He doesn't understand it. Why is the White House uh, basically, you know, doing the bidding of the most radical, demented, Marxist, destructive elements of the left? I think it has to do with this Faustian bargain that the Democratic Party made in the spring of 2020, where the left basically agreed to stand down in the primary and allow Joe Biden as the most mainstream Democratic candidate to capture the nomination on the condition that Biden agree with many of the left's policies. And so when you look back at those unity documents since they wrote during 2020, where basically Biden was agreeing with AOC and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, you see the beginnings of this leftist takeover of the White House. And we saw it again just a few weeks ago where Biden said that he would withhold weapons to Israel. It was another cave-in to the Bernie Sanders left. What Biden doesn't seem to understand is that the left may be hugely influential in our media. It may be very influential in the entertainment industry that's funding his campaign or on the university administrators that he's trying to appease. But overall, the left is something like 9% of American voters. So he's satisfying that 9% while the rest of the country, every race, ethnicity, creed yeah. seems to be unifying against him. You know, going back to that primary debate uh, ahead of the 2020 election, the primary phase, uh, it was June of 2019. There was a debate where there were still a ton of Democrats in the race at that time. Uh, and the stage was asked who would support health care, government, taxpayer funded health care for illegal immigrants. Every single Democrat, to include Joe Biden, raised their hand on that stage. And that was one of just many uh, indicators that that Biden was going to surrender our borders entirely to foreign nationals who were pouring across it and, in fact, encouraged them to do it. How much does this illegal immigration chaos uh, and this invasion play a role in the shifting demographics right now we see in American politics? I think it's very important. I mean, when you look at polls, the border is really neck and neck with inflation as the dominant concern of voters. But I would say, too, when you talk to voters, some of the people who get the most exercised about illegal immigration over the southern border are legal immigrants, including many, many Hispanic Americans who came here legally through the regular cha channels and now see the end of the rule of law and chaos and a humanitarian crisis on the border. They correctly blame Biden. It is just as an aside and, and astonishing to me that Biden denies that his policies are responsible for everything that the voters are rebelling against, whether it's the inflation, whether it's the border, whether it's the deteriorating world situation. It's all back to what Biden did. He doesn't yes. seem to see the connection, but voters do. And that's why Trump is winning right now. Uh, uh, President Trump has talked a, a lot about all of the various things that he wants to do should he return to the Oval Office. In fact, yesterday he was even talking in New York uh, about how he wants to improve the subway system there and make it world class again. And uh, he has all these these ideas. Uh, but I know this week you're writing in the Free Beacon about where he should start, what his priorities should be if he wants to leave an historic legacy. Where is that? Well, that's right. I mean, you know, presidents come into office. They have about six months, really, to enact their agenda, especially if they, if they have a party-controlled Congress as well. So that means you have to prioritize. And I really think when you look at these new voters coming into the Republican Party, working-class voters of every race and ethnicity, you want to do what will satisfy them, what will make their lives better. And so that means you need to focus on stabilizing prices, getting rid of inflation, increasing discretionary income and the standard of living first. And while you're doing that, you need to close down the border.
and in, uh, reassert the rule of law uh, on the southern border and really begin um, policies that will clamp down on illegal migration. Those are the two biggest issues in the country. If Trump wins the election, those issues are the, are, will be responsible for the victory. And so it's important not to get distracted by side issues, yeah. especially on domestic policy, and to stick to your guns, stick to your principles, and focus on the economy and the border. You should have a successful six months. On the economy, here's the big question that I don't think anybody has a clean answer to. The national debt, we're over $34 mm -hmm. trillion now. Uh, mm -hmm. Trump, the, President Trump is, it does not have a huge appetite to tackle the, the big spending packages within the federal government. Those are the entitlement programs. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, boy, in terms of lasting legacy, if you'd like to you know, have an economy that exists for our grandchildren, getting control of that at some point in the very near future seems essential. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there, if anything? It's very important, and there's no doubt about it. But as you say, there are real political constraints to addressing entitlements in the next couple of years. So what I would say to the White House is focus on the spending that we've put out through the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, through the infrastructure bills, through the industrial policy bills, all that spending, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that hasn't gone out yet. You need to cancel that. And then you need to look at the other spending that we can have some political will to control because the spending, the deficit, that's related to the inflation. The more money you have in circulation, the less any particular dollar is worth. So yeah. try to control the spending that you can while slowly making the case to the voters that we will have to deal with these entitlement programs before they bankrupt the country. It's totally critical because then, you know, you want you want out of control costs. Don't stop, you know, let the debt keep running out of control and, and uh, we're never going to catch up. Hey, Matt Continetti, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. It's been a while since we spoke. I'm glad to do it today. Thank you, sir.